All right, it is four o'clock. Welcome to our last session of the day. I'm so glad that you are all able to join us today for Michigan Lakes and Streams Association's 60th annual conference, which is awesome. Um, I am Melissa D. Simone, the executive director of Michigan Lakes and Streams Association. Um, and you are in our final session, which is um, a session with attorney Cliff Bloom, um, water law and current uh, issues. So we are going to go ahead and get started with that in just a minute here. Just a reminder, um, you are likely uh, in this session with your mute, uh, muted and with your video off. Um, we did that so that we could reduce any background noise um, and uh, to help you with your, uh, I'm sorry, it's the end of the day, and to help you with your connection, to make sure you have a good connection. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, probably the best way to do that would be to put them in the chat, to write them in the chat. And um, we will be hanging around um, for Cliff to answer questions for you after his presentation as well. Um, and at that point, um, we can use the raise hand feature um, because that would be fine for people to, uh, to you know, verbally tell us uh, what, the, what the issue is that you would like to talk about. Um, so just stay tuned for that at the after his presentation. Um, so I wanna thank Cliff for joining us today. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. Um, he has extensive expertise in Michigan water and riparian law. He's represented many riparian property owners, lake property and condominium associations, municipalities and others regarding water issues and disputes over the years. Cliff is legal counsel for Michigan Lakes and Streams Association and also legal counsel for the Michigan Riparian Magazine. You've probably seen his uh, articles there. A substantial portion of Cliff Bloom's 37 year legal practice involves representing Michigan municipalities, including townships, villages, and cities. He's well versed in many local government legal matters, including zoning and planning, ordinance drafting and enforcement, special assessment districts, municipal contracts, the Land Division Act, real estate transactions, and other municipal matters. Um, Cliff is legal counsel for over 30 townships, as well as one village and three cities. So he is here to speak to us today, and I'm gonna go ahead and start his slideshow. And you can take it away whenever you're ready, Cliff. Thank you, Melissa. Are we okay on the audio? We are, I can hear you just Great. fine. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate you tuning in to uh, see my presentation and the other ones earlier today. This is uh, Water Law and Current Issues. Um, I'm coming to you from beautiful Round Lake and Grattan Center, just northeast of Kent County. Beautiful day out there. And I look a little bit better than I did a year ago. I took off the uh, Rip Van Winkle beard and cleaned up a little bit. So Looking forward to seeing everyone in person next year. So let's start out with uh, probably one of the five hottest topics in water law and in the lakes around Michigan uh, that I deal with, and that's bottomlands trespass. And let's talk just a little bit about what bottomlands are, how they differ between inland lakes and the Great Lakes, and what are the problems. So. The Great Lakes are, are different. The Great Lakes, uh, and primarily we're dealing with Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. Um, typically, if you're a waterfront or repairing property owner on those bodies of water, it's what they call a movable freehold. You own up to the water's edge, wherever that is in a given day. So as, as folks that spend a lot of times on the Great Lakes know, uh, the water actually moves, and it can move not only daily, but several times a day. We have not regular tides, but kind of mini tides. So today it might be in one location and you might go back in two days on the exact same spot. It might be uh, five feet out or one foot in. So it's a movable freehold wherever the water's located. And uh, the Michigan Supreme Court really dealt with this issue about a decade and a half ago in what we call the Beachwalker case, where they settled once and for all that um, well, we, we already knew that 
uh, a riparian owns up to the water's edge and that the state of Michigan owns the bottom lands that are under the water. What we didn't know was whether members of the public could walk on the shoreline and that case settled it and said that members of the public can walk on the shoreline without the permission of the riparian property owner up to the ordinary high water mark. So as we've discussed in the past, that sounds great, except it's difficult to determine on any given stretch of Lake Michigan or Lake Huron or Lake Superior shoreline where the ordinary high water mark is. And experts can differ. Um, the last couple of years, it's been almost a moot point with the Great Lakes as high as they've been because the water level is further into shore or upland of the ordinary high water mark. So technically, the last couple of years, members of the public really couldn't walk on any dry land adjacent to the Great Lakes without the permission of the repairing property, or they had to walk in the water. Now, depending on how it, uh, the Great Lakes kind of sort out over the next month or so, there might be some exposed dry land on uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron where folks can walk and be dry between where the water is and the ordinary high water mark. So that's coming back into play. On inland lakes, in almost all cases, probably 95% plus, the lakefront property owners or riparians own to the center of the lake. So they actually own the bottomlands, the mucky bottomlands underneath the water. Um, the issue there is at what angle do they own to the center of the lake? And almost never do the riparian lines go at the same angle as the side lot lines, uh, nor do they generally go perpendicular to the shore. The reason for that is if you have a circle or an oval or an odd shaped lake, which is virtually all lakes in the state of Michigan, uh, those bottom lands would overlap. Uh, two different property owners would own part of the same bottom lands, and that cannot occur under Michigan law. So there's a real art out there for repairing surveyors to come up with at what angle your bottom lands go to the center of the lake. Now, why is that important? Because uh, if you're repairing on an inland lake, you control your bottom lands to a certain extent. Only you can have a dock on those bottom lands. Only you can have a, uh, a, a swim platform. Only you can moor boats overnight over your bottom lands. Um, anyone can float or boat uh, anywhere on the surface of the lake once they get onto the lake, but the bottom lands are, are yours. Uh, the one exception under Michigan law is that someone who's out in their boat fishing or during a storm uh, or some similar activities can temporarily anchor on your bottom lands without your permission. And the reason for that is obvious. We want to promote fishing. We want to promote recreation. And if you couldn't even put an anchor on someone else's bottom lands temporarily, that'd be a huge problem. So that can only be done temporarily and uh, you can't do it overnight without the permission of the uh, owner of the bottom lands. <clears throat> okay, so what's the issue? The issue is there are many lakes in the state of Michigan that have sandbars or peninsulas or shallow areas offshore. And on the more crowded lakes, uh, that is a favorite place to party, to moor, to get out and walk and, and so on. So. In some situations, it's become a real nuisance, particularly if you happen to have a cottage next to the only sandbar on the whole lake. Um, on busy weekends during the summer, it can get loud, it can get crowded, and uh, people are partying, and sometimes other things not so nice go on. So what can be done? And it's, it's very frustrating for repairing property on that situation because in actuality, there's little that can be done. Um, the courts really have not addressed the issue on how long someone can anchor uh, on the bottom lands of another at a sandbar to party or have lunch or whatever. There's no two hour rule or six hour rule or, or whatever. The law is also unclear whether they can get out of their boats and walk around on the bottom lands temporarily. Probably not, but the law is not clear. So what, what, a repairing would have to do is actually file a circuit court lawsuit, which is problematic because it, a lot of times it's not the same people that are a problem today as next week. You don't know who the people are. Lawsuits are expensive. They take a long time and they might not be successful. Some municipalities have looked at ordinances to deal with it specifically, and that's been uh, not very satisfying. So 
general ordinances can apply disturbing the peace ordinances, indecent exposure ordinances, drunk and disorderly ordinances. Police officers can write tickets as to those just as easily with people in boats as in vehicles, as in public places and so on. Um, but to actually have an ordinance that says you can't congregate on a sandbar with your boat for more than three hours, it's a difficult ordinance to draft. Most municipalities don't want to micromanage and so on. Probably the best solution is a practical solution, and that is some police officers, Marine and otherwise, will shoo people away. They'll go out and they'll say, please move on. Um, you know, this is too noisy. We don't think it's safe and so on. Do they have the law behind them? It's doubtful. Some police departments do that very well. Um, others won't touch it. They say we don't have legal authority, so therefore we're not even going to ask people. And there's nothing illegal about asking people to do something. So this is an area that I share a lot of people's frustration and that there really has been no good answer to this problem. Um, I did an article on this. I think it was about a year and a half ago in the repair that deals with bottom line trespass. So this is definitely a, a hot issue in Michigan. Um, Melissa, I don't know if there are any questions before I move on, but I, I'd also like to reiterate what Melissa said earlier. Not only will I take questions at the end of the presentation, but I'd love to hear questions throughout because I get tired of listening to myself talk. <laughs> um, not so far, Cliff, uh, okay. but uh, just just so that you remember to let me know when you want me to switch slides, because um, I got behind on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Next slide, please. Thank you, Melissa. Short-term rentals. 10 years ago, we barely heard about short-term rental problems. It just wasn't on the radar screen. Within, especially the last five years, give or take, it's again, probably one of the top five hot problems for lakes around the state, maybe uh, maybe even the top three. So what are short-term rentals? Well, there's no universally accepted definition of a short-term rental, but it tends to be when you rent your cottage or your house for uh, less than, let's say, a couple weeks or a month. You know, the, the situation where, you know, Sue and Bill Smith own a lake cottage Sue gets transferred overseas for two years. They rent their cottage to the same family for two years. That generally has not been a problem. The short-term rentals though, uh, a lot of times, not always, we have to generalize in some of this uh, area, uh, tends to look more like a, a, a mini motel, an Airbnb and so on. So that's where different families rent for as little as a weekend, two days, some others for four days, some for a week, some for two weeks. And uh, this is an area that uh, people are split on. Um, on the one side, you have folks that have bought cottages or homes, uh, cabins strictly for income, and they're rented 100% of the time or whenever they can be rented. Others are family uh, cottages, cabins, condos, and so on, where they're only rented part-time in order to defer the property taxes and the costs, utilities, and so on, whereas the owner of their family uses it the, the, the rest of the time. Uh, and then there's some rare ones where sometimes they'll only rent it to friends and family, maybe for a week or two during the whole um, year. And so the, the folks that are renting their places say, hey, you know, it's a property right. Um, some of them bought it specifically to be a rental. A lot of zoning ordinances don't have anything in the zoning ordinance prohibiting short-term rentals, so they believe they're allowed. Um, and again, the argument is, you know, particularly in rural areas, gee, less government is better. The other side of it is that uh, a lot of people believe in the uh, so-called rental car syndrome that you never take as good a care as you, the car you rent as your own car. Uh, and the idea that uh, people rent uh, cottages, cabins, condos, and so on. And uh, they're perhaps a little noisier. They party a little bit more than if it was at their house. It's their vacation. Sometimes they uh, invite a couple other families to come along or extended family. So there's problems sometimes with noise, uh, sometimes with pets wandering around. Uh, if you rent, you tend not to know the local rules as much. You don't know where property lines are. 
If a short-term rental is on a lake, they tend to bring in boats um, and so on. Um, cities are much better equipped in villages to deal with short-term rentals because they have police departments. They have full-time, most of them, code enforcement officers, zoning officials, Department of Public Works, and so on. However, most waterfront properties in Michigan are not located in cities and villages. They're out in the country in townships. Uh, and most townships don't have police departments. They don't have DPWs. Their staff is part-time. The uh, police enforcement generally is the local county sheriff's department, which is sometimes spread kind of thin, um, sometimes the state police. So it's difficult in the rural areas to police uh, matters like noise, nuisance, barking dogs, um, and so on. So this is an area where more and more lake associations, lake property owners are going to their local municipality and saying, this is a problem. Um, some of the neighbors want short-term rentals banned. They don't want any rentals for less than a year or six months or 90 days. Other folks say, don't ban them, but we want them regulated. And municipalities are all over the board. Um, some municipalities have outright banned short-term rentals. Some are silent. Uh, the problem with a lot of zoning ordinances without extensive review by attorneys, it can't really be determined easily whether short-term rental is allowed or not. And the Michigan appellate courts have dealt probably with seven or eight short-term rental cases over the last few years with local zoning ordinances that are unclear. Um, the municipalities are grappling with, should we ban short-term rentals? Should we do what I call light regulation? which is simply licensing, maybe requiring a license every three years or so, inspections, have smoke detectors, to fairly uh, restrictive ordinances. You know, you can only rent so many times a year and you, you, know, you can't do it on lakes or within so many feet of a lake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the concerns among um, riparians who've been involved in this and municipal officials is uh, some of the real estate groups have tried to get uh, amendments through the Michigan legislature to what we call preempt or preclude local municipalities from regulating short-term rentals. They have not been successful yet um, as to that, but there's a, there's a concern that could happen. And if that happens, then there's virtually nothing a municipality could do. So if you feel strongly about short-term rentals one way or the other, about whether local municipalities should be able to regulate short-term rentals or not, uh, contact your Michigan Senator or your Michigan representative and let them know. Now, I will say, uh, since our law firm represents a number of municipalities, including many rural townships, the argument that um, even if local zoning control is preempted for short-term rentals, municipalities can deal with it with other ordinances I think is a, is a hollow argument to say that, well, you know, you can police them by noise ordinances or barking dog ordinances or nuisance ordinances. Most townships don't have the resources. They don't have the police department. That's kind of waiting till the uh, problem, you know, gets out of hand before dealing with it. So uh, with a local ordinance, you can be proactive ahead of time. That's why they call it zoning and planning. Or if there's preemption and local municipalities can't zone, then they're going to be stuck with trying to enforce those miscellaneous nuisance ordinances. So this is a very hot topic right now throughout Michigan. If you uh, uh, have property in a lake and your local municipality does not deal with short-term rentals, they should. Um, I'm not saying whether that would be strict or light, but it's better to deal with it, even if it's light regulation, than to have a zoning ordinance that's silent where people have to guess and they really don't know. So do we have any questions on short-term rentals and some of the issues surrounding them? I think that um, people must have still been processing the bottom lands because there's a couple of questions that came in about bottom lands. Would you like those or do you want to save those to the end? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. step back a step or two. <laughs> so um, we had, it says, are there liability issues if someone gets hurt on an owner's bottom land? Hold on, Melissa. I thought I turned off my phone. Hold on. Okay, no problem.
I apologize. That, that reminds me of a township lecture that I did, oh, probably 12, 13 years ago. It was a long room and I had a portable mic and I was walking back and forth and the moderator turned, told everyone to turn off their phones. So I was halfway you know, to the back of the room, a phone went off and it stopped. I turned around and gave people bad looks. Was in another part of the room, did the same thing. Then finally I turned around and asked someone up by the desk. I said, that's my phone, isn't it? And they said, yes, so very, very embarrassing. <laughs> So, so, so the question is about liability in bottom lands. Yes. It, are there liability issues if someone gets hurt on an owner's bottom land? There can be, as Mark Teich has probably said, you know, unfortunately, when there's a lawsuit where litigious, and normally everyone's sued, including the neighborhood dog, if anything happens, the question is, are you going to be liable? And by the way, we'll talk about it in a little while. That's why you want good insurance is even if someone files a frivolous lawsuit against you, it could cost a lot of money to get out of it. Uh, and insurance covers that. So yes, um, we've got two different situations where you have, where you do something to the bottom lens, where you improve it, where you have a dock, where you have a boat, where you have a uh, shore station, a boat hoist, a floating raft, a uh, 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 water skiing, um, what do they call it? Not a field, the water skiing. A course. course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. You, you have artificially changed the environment. So if someone runs into it or drowns or whatever, there's a liability potential. And that's why you should have very good insurance. So with boats, you have to have separate insurance. With the rest of it, it's your homeowner. So you want to declare all of that to your insurance agent and do an inventory so they know everything that's out there. If it's natural generally you don't have liability. So if, if someone just drowns, normally you don't have liability. If there's a stump a ways out that you did not put there, nature put there, you generally don't have liability. Someone falls through the ice, you don't have liability unless you've got a bubbler. If you've got a bubbler that weakens the ice, you could have. So if it's a natural condition, and this is true not only in the water, but on dry land and fields and woods, if there's a natural condition that you did not cause or contribute to generally you don't have liability you can still get sued but you're probably going to get out of it fairly quickly if you change the natural environment by structures or posts or fence or docks or whatever then that increases the liability potential all right um, for purposes of determining the riparian rights where does the line start if there is a 20-foot easement between the lot and the lakeshore do you start at the corner of the lot or draw a straight line to the lake through the easement and start at that point at the lake shore? Okay, let, let's talk about if there is no easement and so on. Normally what happens is you take the two points where the lot intersected the lake when the lot was created. So if the lot was created in a plat in 1923, what will happen is you look at the plat and wherever the side property lines intersect of the water, those are the pivot points. And that's where the bottom land lines pivot. If you created a lot in 1973, just by land division splits, again, the same thing's true. Wherever your two side lot lines intersect of the water, those are the pivot points for the lines. And again, the, the riparian lines can go at some real extremes. I mean, everyone thinks theirs is perpendicular to the shore and most times it's not. Sometimes it can be really extreme. Okay, so what happens if there's a land gap between your lot and the water, either a parallel road right of way, a parallel walkway and so on? The pivot point is probably where your two side lot lines intersect the road, the walkway and so on. So a good repairing survey would have to allocate not only bottom lands in the water, but the bottom lands underneath the easement. So in other words, generally under the easement, your side lot lines don't go at exactly the same angle they do on dry land outside the easement. So it takes an expert repairing surveyor to, in either situation to come up with the bottom lands and even under the easement. Um, that's not easy. Um, not all surveyors are repairing boundary line experts. And if your expert disagrees with your neighbors and you can't settle it, you got to go to court to settle it. That's the only way it could be 
definitively settled if you got two different property owners with two different experts who disagree. All right. Um, and then uh, we have some kind of questions slash comments about House Bill 4722. I think it was just introduced this week, they're saying, um, to preempt local short-term rental short -term rental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, been done every session for probably at least four or five years, maybe longer. And Again, let your state senator representative know how you feel. I, I've never been a fan of preemption. Um, you know, it, so many legislators talk that local control is really important. The, the, the government that's closest to the people is important. And then they turn right around and do these preemptions. Um, and, and the problem with preemption, the, the argument's always been at the state level. Well, we need uniformity throughout the state. And uh, the state will regulate it. Well, there's two problems with that. In a lot of these areas, they don't need uniformity. And, and nine times out of 10, the state is not regulating the area or regulating it effectively, okay? So when they take away local control, that generally means that the industry involved has pretty much a free hand. Not always. Sometimes the state agencies in some areas will oversee it, but we've lost all local control or some local control in areas as diverse as mining, group homes, foster care homes, farming, landfills. You're going to love this. Pigeons. Years ago, some zoning ordinance must have prohibited the keeping of pigeons and some indignant legislator got a preemption and it goes on and on and on. So um, if you feel strongly that local municipalities ought to be able to uh, wetlands has been partially preempted to control their own destiny. Let your uh, legislator know how you feel. And the same thing with regard to mining. Uh, mining was partially preempted, but not completely by the state over the last 40 years. The mining industry now wants all local control gone completely and leave it to the state to regulate. So those bills have also been pending. And a lot of mining operations are located near lakes or could be in the future. So that's another one. If you feel strongly, let your legislator know. Okay. Um, I, I see something about uh, addressing the homestead exemption on short-term rentals more than 14 days. Yeah, there is some law on that. I'm not uh, an expert in that. Um, we do have an expert in our office, Amy Yonker, who does the property tax appeals and homestead. Um, let, me, let me say something really quick about that. And that is, um, I do not do estate planning. My firm does not do estate planning. So this is not self-interest. But um, be, be very careful with waterfront property or any property that you don't willy-nilly put kids on deeds, transfer things to trust, transfer things to LLC without a really good estate planning attorney um, to advise you. Uh, assessing is one of the things that can be a disaster. If you do it wrong, uh, the real estate cap can pop up and really you know, double, triple your taxes and so on. There have been some developments over the last couple of years on LLCs where it was always thought if you transferred your, your cottage cabin condo to an LLC comprised of family members, the cap does not pop up and the court of appeals said it does. So on all those things and whether you can take a, a homestead exemption and so on, check with a, a really good estate planning attorney. It's really important. And, and, and I know attorneys aren't cheap, but in that area, it usually pays dividends to have a good expert advising you. Okay, um, there's a couple of other questions, but I think that they might be uh, good ones to save for another point during the presentation. So I will okay. keep those in mind and um, we can keep moving along. Do we, do we have any questions, Melissa, on short-term rentals before I move on? Um, nope, okay. not right now. Mm -hmm. Next issue, high lake levels. Mercifully, we seem to be getting some relief in this area. Um, I haven't seen the weekly Army Corps 
readings on Lake Huron in Michigan, and everyone knows that's really the same lake today. But a week ago, we were 14 inches lower in those two lakes than we were a year earlier. So those lakes and the other Great Lakes are still very high, probably two feet higher than the average, but um, they've gone down. Now, traditionally, this is the ramp up where almost certainly they'll go up until probably mid-August, then ho hopefully stop, start dropping again. And I think as everyone knows, it's been a problem not only on the Great Lakes, but inland lakes also the last couple of years have been, you know, many of them at flood stage, a lot of roads have flooded in Michigan, septic tanks are under underwater and so on. I'm, I'm amazed at how low some of the la inland lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands are this spring. Um, I know I was in the Baldwin area a couple times this spring in areas where creeks are, you know, at their August low, the woods at this time of year would be saturated and it's very dry. So I understand we're almost in semi drought conditions. So the poor, poor farmers can't win one way or the other. So there's been a lot of activity the last couple of years on lakes trying to set a lake level. And the reason they want to set a lake level is it might enable them to do a dam. Seven or eight years ago was the opposite. Lakes were trying to get lake levels set so they could install uh, you know, large pumps to pump water in. Um, the problem in some of the lakes, particularly south of Grand Rapids, is there's been nowhere to put the water. Some of the lakes that are flooded want to let water out of the dams or take out beaver dams and so on, but it would flood the lakes downstream. Um, the bigger issues overall have been on the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Michigan, but Lake Huron also, where last year we reached what we think was the peak and cottages are falling in, things are being uh, flooded and so on. And Eagle, was Eagle and Army Corps of Engineers were issuing permits quite easily for riprap and seawalls and so on. And I think we can understand why. Uh, and sometimes they were issuing permits after the fact. Now, one thing that Eagle and Army Corps did not deal with in their permits, uh, and I kind of wish they would have, is some language as to what happens to all these structures and riprap once the water goes down. That's going to be one of the big issues over the next couple of years if the Lake Huron and Lake Michigan lake levels continue to recede and people want to use the beach and the members of the public want to use the public trust portion of the beach, they're not going to be able to in some areas. There's so many rocks, revetments, you know, metallic walls and so on. So it's too bad, again, that the Army Corps and Eagle didn't put a paragraph in their permits saying we reserve the right to reassess the situation when the water level goes down and requires some of this be removed. Now, obviously some of the uh, protection devices that are buried by sand is not a problematic, but some of these huge boulders uh, block pedestrian access and are potentially dangerous for kids to climb on and so on. So that's gonna be an interesting topic over the next couple of years. You can't win one way or the other. It's either too high or as it goes down, we got to clean up the results of what went on. So some municipalities reacted better than others. Some of them were very proactive. Others just kind of took a wait and see attitude. Um, so, you know, the good news is it looks like the lakes are on their way down the Great Lakes. Based on all historical cycles, that's normally the case. Um, everyone hopes that the historic cycles continue and are not interrupted because if for some reason they went back up again in a year, two or three years, it would be a disaster. Not only economically, but obviously from a recreation standpoint also. Any questions, Melissa, on high lake levels? All right, so um, most of these are, are slightly different than that. So I think- And if you can, you can hold them till the end if that's- mm -hmm. if yeah, yeah, trying. I'm holding on to them, so okay. we should be good. So the next topic is wind turbines, of which you think I could spell it right. Sorry, English teachers out there. Uh, again, 10 years ago, this was not an issue. Um, I think everyone who traveled up north saw the two wind generating turbines at the Straits of Mackinac and 
thought they were interesting, thought they were big, although they're probably half as big as the ones now. So what's happening now, of course, is for a variety of different reasons, uh, they are proliferating. Um, there are different parts of the state that have had them for a number of years. I think there's some over by uh, Whitehall, Montague. Uh, there's some over in the Thumb area. Probably the ones that most people see are between Lansing, north of Lansing, Ithaca, and that area. But now they're also uh, going east and west on 57 to Chessening and, and uh, um, Carson City and eventually Greenville. So they obviously tend to be in areas that are fairly flat without a lot of uh, woods and so on. Um, but they are different. Um, you know, for years, we would see these zoning battles where someone's opposed to a cell tower. Well, with a cell tower though, they tend to be one on the horizon. And if you live near one, you step outside your house, you know, you might see 20 degrees of your visibility obstructed by the cell tower and the other, you know, 330 degrees is unobstructed. Uh, the wind generating turbines in order to make it cost effective to be placed on the grid, the infrastructure and so on, you need a lot of them in a concentrated area. So if you go through some of these wind farms, you'll see, you know, there's dozens and dozens or even more. And for some parts of these community, they, they, they're inundated. And then another concern is that at night, they look a little bit like a nighttime civil war battle. There are lights on them, they're flashing and so on. So this has become a very emotional issue for a lot of people in the communities where they're gonna be placed or they have been placed. Um, they tend to be in rural areas, of course, and uh, um, a lot of the rural landowners have had tough times. Some of the farmers have had tough times, and this is a way of generating some income. So a lot of times it pits the local old-time farm and other families against the, the newbies by the lakes and so on. So very, very heated discussions, maybe even more emotional than a lot of the short-term rental controversies. And the important thing is for the local municipality to have the proper zoning and other regulations in place. Whether the municipality wants to have a light, a light touch or a middle ground where they're regulated fairly extensively or where they're banned altogether. Uh, many municipalities do not have ordinances. Some municipalities figure they're hilly enough and they're in areas where they'll never occur. They may or may not be right. Um, Others think that they have regulations or height restrictions will govern it and they don't. So if you're in an area where large commercial wind generating towers are a possibility, urge your local municipality to adopt reasonable regulations um, regarding those. And again, it's, it's, it's different than it was 10 or 15 years ago. These wind generating towers are quite large, I, I, I think, some of them, once the blade is all the way up, can be up to 600 feet, and they're longer than a 747 that's tilted, you know, tail to point up. So this is going to be an increasing issue. It's only going to happen in certain parts of the state because only certain parts of the state have the conditions of wind necessary for them to be feasible. Um, a lot of times what will happen before they're installed is what they call a MET tower. A testing tower will be put up to measure the wind uh, and the conditions for anywhere from six months to a year or two. So th again, this is an area, uh, again, where there's a lot of emotion. Um, and on the one hand, we've got the arguments going on about clean energy and the necessity to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. But at the other extreme, you have folks, many of whom support green energy, but say, this is just too dense for our community. And again, we're, we're going to be uh, faced with, again, not yet, but in the near future, probably attempts to put wind generating towers in the Great Lakes. So that'll be another, another major issue that'll come up. So that's one of the uh, hot topics in many areas throughout Michigan, um, in areas a lot of times where there are many lakes. Any questions, Melissa? Um, still no questions about this topic, okay. um, so we can just keep going on. Maybe people are waiting for the 
you know, the end. <laughs> the end. Okay. Next one is Lake Access Devices Parks. Um, I've done seminars over and over till some of you are probably bored of it as far as road ends and parallel roads and easements and so on. So I'm really not going to deal with those now, although if people have questions later, I'll be glad to. The area right now that is not as settled is, is dedicated parks. And these come in a variety of different sources. Sometimes they're land strips around, along the lake. Sometimes they're perpendicular to the lake. They almost look like uh, roads. And other times they're inundating, they, they, they vary. So Melissa, if you could go to the next slide. The next slide should be a, a map, yes. So you can see here along the lake, uh, this is Bostock Lake just northeast of uh, Grand Rapids and Kent County. This is a dedicated park. And sometimes they can be dedicated to the public, sometimes they can be dedicated to um, just people in the plat. So what the courts have generally held, not always, and that's why there's some uncertainty here, is that the first tier of lots are likely riparian and they extend under and through the park, which is an easement, so that the first tier lot owners can put in docks and boats adjacent to their adjacent to their lots. Again, though, it would take a riparian boundary surveying expert to give an opinion as to what angle the side lot lines go under the park. Now, a park, though, that means that you don't have full control over your lakefront. Uh, people can lounge and sunbathe and picnic. They can't put in docks, they can't put in boats if they're not first tier lot owners, and they can swim and so on. If it's dedicated just to people in the plat, only back lot owners in the plat can use the park without the first tier riparian's consent. If it's dedicated to the public, then literally anyone can do that. So if we go to the next slide, it's a little bit different. This is Myers Lake, also in Northeast Kent County. And you can see in some places the park is narrow, in other places it's fairly wide. In other places it goes lake, park, road, lots. So there's some question as to whether those lots across the lake are repairing under the park. So again, the majority opinion is the first tier lot owners are repairing, but there have been some appellate court decisions that have said they're not that everyone in the plat co-owns at the park um, or that the developer owns it, but everyone in the plat has an easement. So these are areas that are not really fully settled. Hopefully the courts will settle them because there are many, many plats throughout Michigan that have these parks and separate them from the waterfront. And it's difficult to have such uncertainty involved. Uh, the most recent case was the Virginia Park Subdivision Association v. Brown case. That was a little over a year, a year and a half. It's an unpublished decision by the Michigan Court of Appeals, but that case held that the first-tier lot owners are not uh, riparian. They have no better standing than back lot owners. There was another case that I should have put in here, I didn't, that has a situation of water, park, road, first-tier lot owners held that the first tier lot owners, even across the road are repairing, but again, that's unpublished. So that's not a binding decision. So do we have any questions on uh, parks and repairing rights? We do have questions about easements. Is that something that you would like to take now? Why don't we hold that for the end? Okay, great. Then um, parks can... not, not entirely. Let okay. Just let's make sure this one is, yeah, this is about an easement too. So I just have easements, so we'll hold on to those. Let's hold it. Let's go to property owners associations. One more, Melissa. Okay, lake associations. Uh, these are my words, not court's words that there are strong and weak associations, very scientific uh, labels. Probably 95% plus of the lake owners associations around the state of Michigan are, are weak. They're voluntary. You can't make people join. 
How would you make people join? Well, strong associations typically have deed restrictions that bind the lake, either because it's an artificial lake or the developer imposed it before they sold any lots. Or historically, for whatever reason, when they did different plats, they had a deed restriction saying that you have to belong to the lake association and uh, you don't have a choice. So everything you do with weak associations is voluntary. Memberships voluntary, dues is voluntary. And even if you have rules and regulations, someone could just quit and they're no longer subject to um, you know, the association's jurisdiction. One of the ways that weak associations try to get around that is many times their big, biggest expense is aquatic weed treatment costs. So what they'll do is they'll go to the local municipality, generally a township, and ask the township to do a special assessment district for aquatic weed treatments. If that occurs, then what happens is um, everyone on the lake, it goes on their tax bill and they don't have a choice. And so that shifts the cost from the lake association to everyone on the lake. Strong associations are historic. If you're not part of a strong association, you probably never will be on that lake. To go back and get everyone or almost everyone to sign deed restrictions today is almost impossible. If you're in a condominium association, you'll have a strong condominium association because under Michigan law, when the condominium was formalized, they have to. Their restrictions are in a book about that thick. And uh, under Michigan law, there's got to be a condominium association. You have to join it, and they tend to be strong. So those are kind of the two different associations out there for lakes, same thing's true of river uh, associations, stream associations, uh, and so on. Melissa, if there are no questions on associations, let's go to what might be the, the next slide, might be the most controversial lake topic in Michigan, other than maybe high water, and that's wake boats, also called wave boats, bladder boats, etc. So I've done, I think, four different articles on these over the last five or six years. Um, big issue on a lot of the lakes. Uh, big divide from those folks that own the boats versus those that don't like the boats. And why is this different? Why is this different than a normal speed boat? So wake boats have a feature where basically they pump lake water into holding tanks or bladders and so on. And they're able to throw waves or wakes. Um, they're a lot of fun. They're interesting. And uh, you can surf them without, as I understand it, I haven't done it, without the uh, tethers or cords and so on, although you can still conventionally water ski. And it's my understanding that the function can be turned off so they can be run also as a conventional speedboat. Um, they seem to work quite well in the Great Lakes and very large lakes where they can get 500 feet or 1,000 feet from shore. Um, the waves uh, can be pretty big. And what a lot of people don't know is that the wave under the water is almost as big as the wave on the top of the water. So it's also scouring the bottom, which is problematic from an environmental standpoint in shallow water. So the waves dissipate completely at about the 300 foot mark or slightly more. And it's kind of a kind of a parabola. I mean, if you go 100 feet away from them, you know, it might drop by, you know, 30 feet, and you go, you know, 150 feet, it might drop by two thirds, and so on, to the point when it's at 300 feet, it's very, very little. So they don't do as much damage to the shore and moored boats when they're, you know, 500 feet, 1000 feet offshore. Unfortunately, many of the lakes in Michigan are small. And these boats are uh, uh, occurring in some of the smaller lakes and there literally is not in some lakes anywhere they can go without throwing part of their wave onto the shore or other moored boats. And uh, it causes a real problem. Um, we've had shoreline erosion a lot the last few years. People have put in seawalls and natural barriers and revetments and so on and these boats in some cases have weakened or destroyed those. They've also caused problems to docks and, and so on. Now, the proponents of the boats insist that it's really the high water that's doing it, but the, most of the experts respectfully disagree. Um, there was a great 
seminar at the annual Mission Lakes and Streams Convention, uh, not last year, but the year before when we got people on all sides of the equation to be very civil and to talk about it. And the industry is very aware of the problems um, and wants to deal with them because they know if they don't, um, it can be problematic for them. And so in general, the industry really has not opposed some of the states that want to put a 300 foot rule that, that you can't be within 300 feet of the shore or docks and so on uh, and engage the wave component. Um, they don't like the idea of going much more than that um, and so on. And they've also urged wave boats not to go back and forth, back and forth, quote, mowing the grass in the same area because that disturbs people and the shorelines in that area and to keep the speakers down. A lot of the wave boats have loud speakers on the uh, pedestal or whatever you call it. That's problematic. So I get calls all the time. Is there anything our township, city and village can do about it? And the answer is probably not. You cannot regulate the type of boat that's state preempted. Um, you probably can't regulate waves. That's probably state preempted. Um, the best solution, I think, in my humble opinion, is probably for the legislature to pass a 300 foot rule and basically say you can't engage the wave making component closer than 300 feet to shore or a dock or a moored, you know, at a dock boat. So again, this is a really, really controversial issue. With the lakes going down a bit, that might help, but I, I, I don't see any let up in the uh, the battle over the wake or wave boats. I think Melissa, that will generate some questions. If not now, probably at the end of the presentation. There are a few comments. Um, as far as questions, um, I, I know someone asked about jet skis um, and Yeah, just most most people were were just making comments. Things like yeah, laws. Let's get comments. Yeah, laws are only as good as enforcement. Most lakes don't have a DNR presence. Um, our you know our two legislature uh, members of the legislature that we had earlier were not aware that wake boats were even a thing. So that's something that we'll have to contend with um, educating them about that. Um, someone commented that the 300 foot rule would seem to be quite unenforceable. Um, and what is the definition of a wave boat? An inboard motor is the question. Yeah, the latter, I, I'm not a technical expert on this, but I, I, I think there are standards in the industry that define them. They have bladders and so on, and they have to pump it in to get more mass. Um, you know, the enforceability of the 300 foot rule, I mean, we've had a hundred foot rule forever. So it's been out there. I, again, I'm not an expert, but I, I imagine there are probably ways of, of uh, measuring it as far as lasers and stuff like that. And part of it is question of fact, if you get a ticket and so on, but enforcement is a problem. Um, there are some lakes around the state and I, I really can't cite who they are, but I know they're out there where the lake associations actually purchase additional watercraft patrols. Mm -hmm. And generally you have to go through the municipality. So the Lake Association enters into a contract with the municipality, pays it, and then the municipality enters into a contract with the sheriff's department and so on. This is a classic example, and we're all guilty of it. You mentioned the legislators weren't even aware of it. People have to call, email, and write their legislators if they feel strongly about something. I know we're all cynical. We don't think it'll work, uh, but it does. You know, for every letter of communication that a Michigan legislator receives, there's actually, they've got a formula. They figure if they get two letters, that represents maybe 10% of their constituents. I, I know Dave Maturin can address this because he was in the legislature. So don't, don't assume, particularly at the state level as opposed to the federal level, that letting your local legislator know about your concerns and so on doesn't have an impact because and a lot of times it does. Um, we also had a comment about wake boats uh, disturbing the bottom with propulsion with their propulsion system, um, so that this person was saying that a minimum depth depth should also be required, uh, as opposed to just a certain distance from shore. 
Um, yeah, although let me say the distance, the waves dissipate, whether they're above the water or under, almost completely at 300 feet. Not completely, but pretty close. And it's geometric. So, you know, again, by the time it gets 200 feet, the waves are pretty pretty small. By 300 feet, they're real small. So having a, a, a two or 300 foot rule would also cause the waves underwater to be dissipated pretty well also. Well, um, I think, and I think that uh, when we have our results from the study out of Minnesota, which we're anxiously awaiting, there will be a presentation. I'm just going to plug it real quick. On June 16th at 4 p.m., we're getting together with Maine Lakes so that the, the researcher can, can talk about his uh, findings. Um, there is some concern about scouring of the bottomland right where that boat is being used um, because of the propulsion system. So, um, I think that maybe they were talking about a lake that's pretty shallow, um, even 300 feet out um, is what I think they were talking you know, about. Okay. They're, they're a lot of fun. And they're, you know, I've, I've talked to more than one boat industry person who said they're keeping the, the industry, pardon the pun, afloat. I mean, that's a huge, pro just like SUVs and trucks are the most profitable of the big three right now. So, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the things that people just don't want to hear, but they're candidly probably some lakes where they shouldn't be in the lake. You know, just as you, you don't usually keep a Ferrari in a residential neighborhood, you know, we might have to have an argument about that. I, wake boats intrigue me because if, if tomorrow, if the trucking industry came out with a new semi truck that is fuel efficient and does everything, yet its wake mows down half the mailboxes along the side of the road, you don't think something would be done pretty quickly? It would. And in this case, they're, in some lakes, they're doing a lot of damage to the shoreline, a lot of damage, and it just doesn't seem to be addressed. So with that, Melissa, why don't we move on to the next slide, which is local ordinances. All right. Just as you can influence your state legislator, a lot of times by letters, emails, and telephone calls, the same thing is true with regard to your local township, city, and village government. So for protecting your waterfront, I, I think the best resource available is local government, particularly zoning ordinances. So probably 98% of the people out there don't care about local zoning, don't think about local zoning until it affects them, until there's a development going in by them on the lake or a wind generated tower farm is going in a, a mile away or a, a sand mining operation is proposed half a mile away. And unfortunately that reactive um, dealing with zoning a lot of times is too late. You really wanna have good zoning regulations in effect and again, that's why they call it zoning and planning to be out ahead of it. So some of the common, and, and by the way, typically municipalities only have two types of ordinances, zoning ordinances and everything else. So everything else would be what we call police power or regulatory ordinances, the building codes, nuisance codes, wetlands codes, uh, 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 disturbing the peace, uh, blight, junk, all that good stuff. Those are not zoning. It's zoning and everything else. So in zoning, uh, a, a good zoning ordinance will have funneling regulations that will prohibit new developments from unfairly giving lake access to big developments off-site. Uh, dock regulations, how many docks you can have on your property, how long they can be, and so on. Setbacks from the lake is a big issue, uh, and sometimes it's difficult because some of the older plats have small lots where you almost have to be close to the lake, but the further back a house is from a lake, the less environmental and visual impacts there are on lakes. Private roads are important to have good private roads around lakes. Uh, private roads around lakes are pretty common. Uh, it's important to have good regulations for safety, but also to have certain standards because I think eventually banks and mortgage companies probably aren't gonna loan money for houses on substandard private roads. Minimum lot size and width. Uh, the ideal is on uh, in new developments to have bigger. Uh, the idea that uh, 
you should be able to have today new lots only 40 50 feet on the water is considered poor planning new lots can't do anything about the lots from 100 years ago but new lots should probably be a lot bigger on the lakefront so zoning is really important uh zoning is recommended by the planning commission um and then the local legislature adopts it upon their recommendation so the other ordinances melissa if you can go to the next uh slide these are police power regulatory ordinances everything other than zoning again some municipalities regulate docks and boats in their zoning some in police power ordinances some in both those are important dune protection which is generally along lake michigan wetlands municipalities have been partially preempted but they can do some wetlands regulations and land division ordinances are important that the local municipality has to review all land divisions before they occur so melissa if we can go to the next one no uh go back one there we go this is what used to be called squatters rights uh prescriptive easement and adverse possession so basically if you use the property of your neighbor or nearby property for 15 years or more without permission you potentially can get title to that property or a permanent easement the difference between the two is adverse possession is where you're next to a property you fence part of it in you use it exclusively for 15 years you actually get title to that land strip. Prescriptive easement is where you co-share a driveway or a private road or something else across another person's property. You don't use it exclusively, but there is no easement there and they didn't give you permission. You can get a permanent easement after 15 years. And to get both of those, you've got to go to court to do it. And you don't have to pay anything for it. So in many of the old plats, this is a real problem because properties overlap. Um, there's no good private road um, easements. Uh, it's crowded and people tend to use other people's property. The roads aren't where they're supposed to be. So the main thing is if you're defending against one of these, if your neighbor's encroaching or using your property, you really have to deal with it, even if they're a good friend. Because if you don't, after 15 years, you're gonna lose a property right. So. One way of doing it is say, hey, stop using my property, or hey, I've talked to my attorney. You can continue to use it with my permission, but you've got to sign an agreement. And uh, you know that will break it. Um, basically, it'll say that you've got my permission, and at any time upon six months or a year, I can tell you to stop. So these are really nasty areas. You can lose property inadvertently. Um, and the bottom line is if someone else is using your property, see an attorney because you really should deal with it or you risk losing your property. Melissa, any questions on that? All right, let me see here. While you're looking, this is a very complicated area. I've done two or three articles on this. But it's basically 15 years without permission. If, 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 if the person across whose property they're using gave permission and can prove it, then they can't get prescriptive easement or adverse possession. It's gotta be what we call adverse. Yeah, I, I don't see any questions specifically about that. Okay. So we can let's, move on. Let's go on to the next one. By the way, that, that glowing light in Halo is not me. So, and I tried to block it. I, I hope that's not blocking the, the view people have. Um, encroachments and surveys. Uh, this is kind of a sleeper area. You know, obviously if you're buying or selling real estate, you normally have a survey, but if you're buying property and the surveyor and, and, the, and the seller wants to give you an old survey, don't accept it. Either have them do a new survey staked or do your own because the problem with old surveys is things could have happened in the interim there might be new buildings built over the line sidewalks driveways and so on and encroachments are not good for two reasons number one after 15 years they can claim the property but number two it really gums up title if you have to sell your property and you're in, and they're encroaching on you and actually if you're encroaching on them that's a problem sometimes if you want to sell your property so and if you're not sure, even if you're not buying or selling uh, real estate, but you're not sure where the line is and 
you think you might be encroaching on the neighbor, have it done. Um, it's good to have the irons in each corner. And what's smart, because surveying's not cheap, is a lot of times what I do is I'll dig around maybe a six inch radius around the iron, maybe three or four inches down, pour ready mix cement around it so the iron's about that far up. And then when it's dry, put dirt around it and grass. That way they stay more. If you've got a long boundary, you might want to have the uh, surveyor put in an iron or a metal fence post every 75 feet or so. So uh, yeah, surveys are important. Encroachments are not good. You might think, oh, it, it helps me. My, my sidewalks on my neighbor's property, my driveways, you know, I got more property. Try to sell it on the spur of the moment. That'll really gum up your sale a lot of times because it makes buyers and title insurance companies nervous that either you have part of your stuff on the other person's property or worse, they encroach on yours. So kind of important area. So let's go on to special assessments. Um, these have always been common, but they're increasing, I think, more and more every year. So this is a way that a lake or a river can do things like improvements, uh, aquatic weed treatments, dredging, and so on, where everyone on the section of river, creek, or lake pays an amount to the local government. It goes on the tax roll, so it's mandatory. So it's, there's normally a process. Uh, most special assessments for lakes are in uh, townships, but sometimes if a lake is in a city or village, it might be there also. So there's a process where you can initiate it by citizen petition. You normally need 51% of the land area in it. And municipalities don't like doing them because they're pretty complicated and they take two public hearings. They're kind of a pain. Uh, but once they're established, the overwhelming majority of people are satisfied with them. They tend to be rather modest. I think for weed treatment, you see per lot anywhere from 50 to 150 bucks, sometimes on the, like per year. Sometimes on the smaller lakes, it's more than that. Uh, again, I've done probably three or four articles over the years for the Michigan Repairing Magazine on this, but two things. If you're going to do a petition, you probably ought to have an attorney knowledgeable in the air to draft it so you don't go and spend all this time having it done just to have the township say, no, it's legally insufficient. Second of all, if your township's going to do it, they should really have an attorney who knows what they're doing do the process because it can be challenged if it's not done right. So, you know, pros and cons, you know, obviously the pros is everyone pays on the lake or river involved. So you don't have freeloaders. Um, they tend to be relatively modest, the cost. Uh, especially when the average assessment is probably less than a new section of dock cost. The cons are, it's like a tax. Technically, it's not a tax, but it's like a tax. It's not deductible on your income taxes if you itemize like property tax. And some people just don't like more government. So there are pros and cons to special assessment districts. So Melissa, unless... You see um, we did have a question about... We had a couple of questions about special assessment districts okay, um, that might be of interest to you, especially. Um, it says, we started a special assessment district and just before our first township meeting, COVID hit. When might we expect our township to hold the first meeting? Do we have to start over again? What do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure you do have to start over again. The, the petitions are don't legally get stale. They might practically get stale. Township might say, well, these are two years old. We don't want to accept them. Um, they could have done it over COVID because under the governor's orders, most municipalities did meet and do public hearings via Zoom or teleconference or both. So I don't know, you're probably in a very rural township, but um, you know, if, if the township says you got to do them over, I guess you got to do them over. So I just keep asking the township, Townships never have to do special assessment districts. You could get a hundred percent signature and they could still say no, either after going through the process or up front. But again, it really costs them nothing if all their attorney fees, all the publication costs and so on, if the district is approved is rolled into the district, it's some work for them. Some say, well, we don't want to incur this because if we decide not to do it, well, then a lot of times they'll say to the Lake Association, we're not gonna pursue this unless you put a certain amount of money in escrow with the township. If the district goes through, we'll refund that. 
uh, because it'll be on the tax roll. If not, we're going to keep it to pay for our attorney fees and costs today. So I guess I, I, I would sit down with your township officials and say, number one, do we really need new petitions? I mean, if they're less than a year, year and a half old, I think they're still valid. And when are you going to start going on this and see what the township has to say? All right. And then um, another one about special assessment districts. If a lake is in four townships, um, which public act is most applicable? 185, 188, or 309 when the Lake Association is thinking about forming it to begin with? Most of us lawyers don't go by uh, act numbers. We go by MCL. But I think what you're talking about is 188 is the general township special assessment. And the problem there, you'd have to do four different townships. The only way of getting around that is a statutory lake board. And there's a lot of pros and cons on that. And again, I've done two or three articles for the repairing magazine, so you can look at back issues. But a lake board uh, can straddle not only multiple municipalities, but multiple counties. Um, it's generally done by petition. Most lake boards work pretty well. They have a, the special assessment component, but the problem with the lake board is some people say two problems. It's another layer of government. And number two, once they're created, if you happen to have a Frankenstein, they're almost impossible to kill. And there are times where lake boards kind of run away. Most of them, again, I think work fairly well. But again, multi-jurisdiction, probably the only way of doing this is statutory lake board, statutory lake improvement board. And then we have one more question about special assessment districts. How can the increased po property value of the special assessment district be calculated? I think we mean, how can they calculate their own property value? Well, increase? actually, if they're going to challenge it, the way you challenge a special assessment district is not in court, but the Michigan Tax Tribunal, just like a tax appeal. And the municipality has to show that the amount you pay is roughly proportionate to the benefit, which is an increase in property value. It's usually pretty easy for the municipality to prove that. You know, I mean, if your property is worth $500,000 and you pay $100 a year, most experts will testify that cleaning the lake is worth a lot more than $100. But that, the, the question is right. That is a test. Uh, rough proportionality is the increase in property value, roughly equal to the amount of this assessment. The, the tougher cases are like dredging and so on. You know, you might have a $5,000 total assessment or even a, you know, a $25,000 assessment over 25 years, $1,000 a year. Those are tougher for the municipality to prove. We're going to see a lot of these with the two dams that went out. Probably the only way that those dams are going to be redone is by at least some special assessment component. I'm not, I'm not going to say there's not going to be any state or federal aid at all or private aid or the responsible party, but it's likely at least some of the funds are probably going to come from a special assessment district. Okay, well, I think we will uh, move on. State statutes. Um, there are many state statutes that affect the waterfront, but probably four in particular stand out. I'm using the old names. These have all been folded into the Michigan Environmental Code, but they still kind of exist as sections. One is the Inland, uh, Michigan Inland Lakes and Streams Act. That deals with uh, things like marinas, fill, in lakes, dredging in lakes, seawalls, and so on. It's a process you have to go through in, at now the Department of Eagle. The Dune Protection Act uh, governs most of Lake Michigan dunes. The Wetland Protection Act, I think we all know about that. And then the Natural Rivers Act. You, you don't hear that much about the Natural Rivers Act anymore, maybe because it's now, I think, 35 or 40 years old and it seems to be working, but it has a whole regulatory scheme for many of the rivers and their tributaries in Michigan as far as fertilizers and setbacks and all those good things. So the next part of the slides are multi-slides on the public trust doctrine. And I'll just let folks read that. Um, it's kind of a esoteric concept, but I think it's interesting. So Melissa, if you can flip all the way through, it's the second to the last slide lakefront liability. I think it's page 25. There we go. 
I, I know that some of the speakers have already talked about this, but uh, again, I'm not an insurance agent, but it's really important to have good liability insurance. If you have a property on a lake, river, or stream, you should review it periodically. You know, I used to say $500,000. Candidly, today, you really ought to have at least a million. And you can get umbrellas on top of that, um, usually for not much more money unless you have teenage drivers. Um, there's just so many things that can happen on the waterfront. People can drown. They can get hit by a boat. They can, you know, um, dive into the shallow water and so on. It's really important to have good insurance. It gives you peace of mind. And even if someone files a totally frivolous lawsuit against you, it could cost you ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars in attorney fees to get out of it. You, even when you're right, that you can't recover, and insurance will normally cover those attorney fees. But you should periodically meet or online or in person with your agent. I think it's good to make lists of everything you've got on a lake. You know, we've got a house, we've got a pole barn, we got this dock, we got this shore station, we got this swim raft, you know, we got this water tether ball. Uh, the boats are separate. We got this shore station. Um, it's just in today's litigious society, it's really important to have good insurance. Um, so you have peace of mind. So Melissa, that's all I've got with regard to the, the presentation itself. Uh, but again, I'm more than happy to take questions and comments now. And, and I know you've got some of them saved up. So let's go at it. I am biased, by the way, about both the repairing website and our firm website. There are a lot of resources and articles on those. I can go back to that slide. I just thought people would want to see your contact information too. Thank you. But lots of, uh, and we'll have these slides available for people after the presentation as well. So that will be helpful. Okay, so do you so, still have the, Melissa, you I'm, still have the recording last year when I look like Rip Van Winkle. Is that still available? Yes, that is still available. It's Forever. there. <laughs> Forever. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a few different uh, questions and I put them in categories. And if you think of questions, anyone, uh, while we're going through the ones that have already been in the chat, then I will get to those. Um, if you would like to raise your hand, that would be fine too, um, because you can probably represent your issue better than I can um, by explaining it uh, out loud. So um, going back to the parks issue earlier, um, this question was, who is responsible for maintaining those parks that you were mentioning? Yeah, unfortunately, this is kind of a no person's land. And again, most courts have held that they are uh, easements only. So if it's between you and the lake, you're going to want to maintain them because you're going to want to exercise as much jurisdiction and control over them as you can. If they're in their, if, if they're in your side yard going down, then you technically probably own to the middle of it. And it would be smart for you to maintain it to the center, make sure the insurance company knows about it. Um, because you have some liability. If you own underneath it and you're using it anyways, you potentially have some liability. What's tough is the ones that are, um, no one's around them. They're falling down. They're junky. It, it, there, there's just no good answer to that. If it's private, then probably technically everyone in the plat should kick in. If it's municipal, the municipality could do it, but the municipalities generally don't have any funds. So these parks today would be done a lot differently than they were a hundred years ago. Unfortunately, till someone invents a time machine, we can't go back and undo kind of the sloppy way that these parks are dedicated. Um, and then also you might find this uh, interesting. The same person who mentioned about, you know, the COVID issue with their special assessment district. Um, well, actually maybe it's not the same person, but when we were talking about that, um, it says, uh, it doesn't seem there's any standard for special assessment districts going through the process with our township. Now we circulated a petition during COVID and used email and electronic signatures to complete township charged for attorney fees, public notices in the paper, and will charge an annual administrative fee for collecting the funds as well. I just thought you would want to hear that. Yeah, the comment. problem is special assessments, the statutes are pretty clear, although even they don't answer everything. It's a fairly complicated area. And I think 
probably the way to do it right is if there's a lake association that's a proponent to have multiple meetings with the membership before you go to the township, meet with township officials, because it, it, it really is a fairly complicated process. I think a lot of times people feel it's not transparent or there's something almost sinister about it. And part of it is just the complexity. Uh, a lot of these townships have never done one or they haven't dealt with it. Um, and it, it's funny how often townships get blamed for them. And nine times out of 10, they're doing it because they think the overwhelming majority of people in the lake community want it. So it's kind of a thankless job for townships sometimes, but yeah, it, it's a complicated process. Okay. I, I, I wish, by the way, the, the legislature would simplify it. All right. Um, and here's another question. Are historical deed restrictions under attack with the new law being discussed? Um, it doesn't say which law particularly, and I'm not sure myself, but maybe you, you know, Cliff. Um, yeah, it says our, oh, I'm sorry. I was, that's, that. that's okay. The okay. Michigan Marketable Title Act was amended, and we did that article in the Repairing Magazine, I think, two issues ago. So, oh, okay. Michigan has had the Marketable Title Act for probably 60, 70 years. And it is intended to get rid of dormant, worthless property interests. So a lot of it's oil and gas. You know, there was an oil and gas lease that was signed, you know, 40 years ago, no activity, doesn't mean anything to anyone, that would be extinguished under that act. Or someone severed the mineral rights 100 years ago, there's no oil in the area, there's no sand and gravel, it would extinguish that. Well, Unfortunately, the Michigan legislature, a lot of times legislation we need, they don't do and legislation we don't need, they do do. And the title companies in particular were just tired of searching these hundred year old deed restrictions, even though a lot of them are very valuable. So they got through a statute that I think everyone was stunned about a few years ago that basically says if a deed restriction is 40 years old or older, unless you file a notice of claim, by March, I believe it was 29th, 2021, it goes away, it's gone. And everyone's been asleep at the switch. So I and a, a handful of other attorneys started, you know, raising the alarm bells that if your deed restrictions are more than 40 years old, you've got to file a notice of claim by March of 2021. And unfortunately, the statute's complicated. You can't just, it's not a one sentence notice of claim. You, you got to go through some stuff. So here's a piece of legislation that is incredibly harmful to people, does no one any good other than the title insurance companies because they just don't want to search back that far. Well, we did that article in the Repairing Magazine, I think in late November. Well, near the end of December, they actually came up with a legislative delay to delay it for three years until March of 2023 or 24. So you have until then to file the notice of claim to preserve your deed restrictions if they're 40 years old or older. We're hoping that the legislature will just take it out of there. It's just, it, it, there's just no reason for it. It's irresponsible legislation. But I'm kind of surprised that not more real estate attorneys and uh, realtors are, are aware of it because most time deed restrictions are a valuable property, right? And to just lose it, because the legislature kowtows to the title insurance companies, I think is atrocious. So that's what that is. Right, and now that you say that, I'm sorry that I didn't remember it. I think because you told us that we could take a deep breath that I uh, <laughs> let that deep fall breath. to the bottom Although, of my list. Again, <laughs> when you folks are calling your legislators, this would be a good one to say, hey, just that legislation that sunsets deed restrictions, get rid of it. It's just, it's a trap, it's a trick. I think it's disruptive. All right, we have a hand raised. We have uh, Diane. If, Diane, if you would like to unmute yourself, we would love to hear your question. Yes, yeah, so my question is, our township has, as far as I know, uh, funneling laws, but our Lake Association allows members to moor at our jointly owned properties how is that not funneling? Well, the, the, the township 
laws trump anything the lake association does so uh you might want to talk to the township if the lake association is allowing something that's unlawful number one they shouldn't but number two it's up to the township to enforce their ordinance so you you can't the lake association can't negate township ordinances or zoning now maybe their grandparent i don't know maybe maybe the ordinance is drafted in such a way that it doesn't cover the situation you're talking about but um, if the township ordinance applies, then 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 people ought to ask the township to enforce it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Anita, we will take your question next if you wanna unmute yourself. Okay. I don't know. We'll we'll hold off on Anita for a second. Craig, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Oh wait, no, Anita's got it. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, I'm the president of our Lake Association, um, Woodland Lake in Brighton, Michigan, and our Lake Association owns the dam on the lake, trying to get liability insurance for the dam is near impossible. Does anyone have any suggestions on where to get liability insurance? There, there are very few companies that will write a policy for a yeah, lake Anita, association let, with the dam. Let me let me start out and other people can chime in. But Melissa, if if you could get Anita's information, there is one insurance company that's been associated with MLSA and I know has advertised for years and they kind of uh, are experts in that. So if we can get Anita that information. But Anita, what I, have you had conversations with the local drain commissioner about taking over the dam? Yes, we have. And our Lake Association members don't want anything to do with the drain commission. They've not been very helpful for, to us at all. Yeah, and I, our, I understand that. But here's the problem is if that dam goes out and there's liability, um, they're going to try to what we call pierce the corporate veil. Is your Lake Association incorporated? Yes, it is. That probably gives you some um, insulation against liability, but not completely. I mean, dam goes out, there's millions of dollars of damages. They sue the Lake Association, they pierce the corporate veil, and then they go after everyone in the Lake Association. That's the problem. The risk is probably fairly low, but there is a risk. I mean, if I was on your lake, I would I would be talking to the drain commissioner about setting a statutory lake level and have the drain commissioner take over the dam. Unfortunately, the drain commission doesn't want to work with us. Well, I, it, I suppose it, if we got the petitions, they would have to. They Maybe, would, they I would, don't know. They, they, would, they would likely have to. And I would go to my county commissioner and say, this is the drain commissioner's job. But yeah, I, I I wouldn't sleep very well at night if I was a member of your lake association and you don't you you don't have insurance or you're worried in the future you won't be able to get it, but you do have it now. No, we do have it now, but Good. the cost the cost is almost prohibitive. It's fifteen thousand dollars for the year. How many how many lots in the lake? Three hundred. Yeah, see the pro Unless you can get the drain commissioner to take it over, you almost have to pay the insurance premium no matter how much it is. Okay. The, the liability potential is just staggering. Right. And especially after what happened in Midland. Yeah. One, to... one, of, one of the ideas I know some of the legislators are, are, are um, debating, although the governor hasn't gotten behind it, is a, a uh, what they call a reinsurance program where for dam for dams and impoundments and so on, the state would be the secondary insurer. So that would help low that that would insure coverage by private companies uh, at lower rates. Right. Because the idea would be that if there's a catastrophe, the insurance company would have to bear it all. The state would bear part of it. And and those types of arrangements are very common in many industries. So that's another one you guys might want to talk to your legislator about. Okay, well, we used to have Frankenmuth insurance, which was wonderful, and and their um, premiums were not as high as, but they're no longer offering that service to, for, to us. So 
I don't know if they don't want to deal with us, but um, it, it's kind of frustrating because um, a- after what happened in Midland, you've got to have insurance. Anita, the other thing you might want to do, there, there, are, there are hundreds of lakes around the state that have dams. Right. Have you called some of them and said, hey, who's your insurance agent and insurance company? Yes, and we got a couple of names and I interviewed several of them, but when they find out that we have the dam, they won't, they won't deal with us. Yeah, I understand. So those yeah. are some ideas. I don't know if anyone, Melissa, out there has any ideas. Our, our dam is rated high hazard, which is part of the problem. Yeah. I haven't seen anything in the chat, but I did make myself a note to follow up with Anita um, with some insurance recommendations from our advertisers. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Cliff. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Anita. All right, Craig, I think you are up. Hi, Cliff. Uh, I want to know how an easement can be abandoned, dissolved, removed. Can you tell me, Craig, how one person can move the earth? (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, they normally can't. I mean, the, the flippant answer to that is if you've got every beneficiary of the easement signs a release and extinguishment and you record it, but of course an easement is a property right. So almost never will the easement beneficiaries um, agree to have them extinguished. Now, um, if the easement was created by a plat, if it's a road easement, a park easement or whatever, the only way to do it is what they call a circuit court plat vacation process, but it's very expensive. You have to join everyone in the plat. And if anyone has a reasonable objection as to the easement being vacated, the court can't, cannot grant it. So those tend only to work where it's dormant ones and so on. But yeah, it, with, without the consent, written consent of all the beneficiaries of an easement. Now, if they're misusing the easement, you can sue them and try to get a court order and injunction limiting them to the proper usage rights. Could something occur above the you know individual homeowner level at some level of government? No, uh, because they're private. Pro- two things, they're private property matters, so government can't get involved. Second of all, government likely would not have standing. Now, the government can regulate easements. I mean, there are many municipalities that regulate park, private parks and road ends and um, private road easements and so on, so they can regulate it. But as far as getting it extinguished, um, no, in, unless the municipality joins in, in a plat vacation case. But again, if anyone objects to the court vacating the easement, it's probably not gonna get vacated. That answers my question, thank you. Take care, Craig. You too, thanks. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Lisa. Hi, thanks, Melissa. Hi, um, Cliff. So this Hi, is Lisa. an easement question too. So on a lake that has a, an easement that runs around the whole perimeter of the lake for ingress and egress, um, there are also alleys that look like they go all the way to the lake. So the question is, does the alley, and the alley is for ingress and egress, getting boats in and such. So does the alley go all the way to the lake or does it stop at the easement? Yeah, so the the first easement you talked about is what we call a parallel road or easement. And by the way, that's generally not access to the lake. It's access along the lake, but Again, the courts have not definitively addressed this, but most experts think that you've got what we call the T-bone situation, the alley T-bones into the parallel road. It, yes. Most people, most legal experts think that the alley does go through to the lake and gives access, but most alleys, whether they're public or private, it's it's ingress and egress travel only. You, usually no, no docks. Once in a while, they'll allow a dock for day use only, but no overnight boats, no lounging, right. no sunbathing, no shore stations, no, yeah. Okay, that's that was my thought too, but I just wanted to get your opinion. It, it's highly it, likely in the T-bone situation, the alley probably does go through into the, the easement. Lake. Okay, and then, so a judge wouldn't potentially give that alley by way of a quiet title 
to you, if it was somebody. created in a plat, which most alleys are, you'd have to do a plat vacation lawsuit. You'd have to sue everyone in the in the in the plat, yeah. state of Michigan, local municipality. And if anyone has a reasonable objection, the judge cannot vacate it. Gotcha. That's what I want. And by to the know. way, and by yeah. the way, over the last thirty years, there's a statute that says. If, if a judge is thinking of, of extinguishing any lake access, they have to offer it to the local municipality first and then the DNR second before he can extinguish it. Okay, great. I think I read that in one of your articles. Yeah, unfortunately, it's unlikely it would be extinguished. Okay, no, that's good. I want the alley to stay there. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. But by, by the way, most repairings don't have a problem with road ends and alleys. It's the misuse of those. That's the problem. If they were used for what they're intended, you know, for hand launching boats and going down and swimming and ice fishing, it's generally not a problem. It's when people try to illegally appropriate them for their own dockage, boat moorage, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to go back to some of the written questions because I don't see any more hands at this moment. Um, this one says, and I hope I'm representing this correctly, um, if you are on a point where there is an easement on the side and in the front of the lot, is the pivot point used on the side of the back lot corner? I have to see things visually and, and without it. And I think the, the best way is probably get a surveyor and see what the surveyor says. So I, ha I had trouble visualizing that yeah, one too, that's why. Let me repeat, if there's no easement and so on, it's where the side lot lines of a lot when it was created, the two points where it intersected the water, that's the pivot point when you go beyond. If, if, if it's lake, parallel road right of way, first tier lot owner, it's where the lot intersects the road right of way is the pivot point. But at what angle it goes under the road and under the water, and it could be two different angles. It might go under the road this way, and when it gets to the lake, it might go this way. So again, you really need an expert repairing surveyor to, to address those issues in a particular case. Okay. In the absence of water surface at the time of the plat record, can high water, as determined by local surveyors, mark by a local surveyor's mark be used to define pivot point? It's really not supposed to. It, it, you're supposed to go back to when the lot was created, even if it was the original government lot. Now, the problem, the, the, the difficult cases are when it was originally done was like a wetland or a pond, and then it's dammed up and becomes a lake. Technically, artificial lakes are not supposed to have repairing rights, so we don't know what the bottom lands ownership is, and the courts threw that bombshell out about 10 years ago and really have not defined it, and again, I think I've done two or three articles for the Repairing Magazine, but generally the pivot points, if it started as a lake, don't change, whether the water goes up or down. Okay, and I know that there was a follow-up in the chat about the uh, deed restrictions uh, question again. Um, the person who asked that question had some more details to that. Um, she said, in our area, we have about 10 lots that are said to have deed restrictions that we can't split the lots. And there are 12 easements for access through the lots. Um, and the frontage is 150 feet in the deed. So she wants to know, is that gone? I assume that it's not gone right now, but they need to try no, to protect but, but that. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if they don't file a notice of claim in two years or three years or whatever, it might go away. Okay. But that, that statute has been delayed, I think, three years. There might right. be other reasons why they're in, I, I mean, sometimes deed restrictions become dead letter if they've been violated repeatedly over time. Some deed restrictions were defectively created. They're not valid, but that, that's a minority. Most deed restrictions are valid. Um, there are some illegal deed restrictions. There are racial covenants, which have been illegal since I think 1966. Uh, there's some restrictions that prevent foster care homes. Those are illegal. But other than that, the overwhelming majority of deed restrictions are illegal. That's why this Marketable Title Act legislation is so insidious is if it's not rescinded three years from now, there could be thousands of sets of deed restrictions around the state that are 
invalid. By the way, I think the, I also think the statute's unconstitutional, but that's a different issue. Any leftover, Melissa, from before? Or have I talked everyone out? Some leftover ones, but I did see a hand, and so I didn't know if Tricia wanted to unmute and ask her question. Sure, I have two questions, actually. The first one, I'm not even sure if this is a question for Cliff. I work with property owners who are trying to restore their shoreline, install, reinstall natural shorelines, for example. And often the question comes up, can they restore their shoreline back to the point where it was originally deeded? If there's been excessive loss of shoreline due to erosion, what sorts of mechanisms are available for them to possibly petition to be able to restore tens of feet of lost um, land? Well, I think it, there's some natural shoreline protections, depending on where they lay, that you do not need a permit for. But a lot of them, you need an eagle permit. So you need an eagle permit. The, the problem you would have with that is with unnatural shore restoration, riprap and so on, you also can't do it in a way that it would adversely impact your neighbors. So if, if you're trying to go too far out into the lake, number one, Eagle's probably not going to issue a permit, but even if they did, you've got to be cognizant, is that going to affect your neighbors on either side? Specifically, I have people that are dealing with... Uh, um, uh, side impacts of adjacent properties that have put in seawalls and now they're losing their shore and they want to naturally restore their shoreline um, with bioengineering and whatnot and wonder how far they can extend into the lake to their you know pre-existing land and how that, to go that's going to be an eagle number one that's going to be an eagle question but it could be a legal issue too depending on how that affects the neighbors right and then my second question is a little more complex, <laughs> and that is in regard to um, the Lake Association that I work with is supporting and promoting the adoption of an overlay district for enhanced zoning. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the pushbacks that we've gotten from a few people in our community is that they regard um, the pro some of the proposals as being overreaching and that they could be construed as a taking of property because they might restrict the use of the property at the point where it, they're, they're saying it would now no longer be able to be sold or developed as view property, for example, because of proposals related to maintaining a certain percentage of natural vegetative cover wherever possible is the language that's used in the proposed ordinance. Um, what are your, your thoughts on that line regarding um, takings? Well, a couple, a couple things. Number one, Michigan does not recognize any right to a view. Some states do, but Michigan does not. Um, in order for, there are two types of takings. The, the original type of taking that the law dealt with 100 years ago is where the government physically invades your property. Uh, a, a new airport goes in and, and, and the planes are so loud, they, you know, they essentially drive you nuts. Or there's a, uh, there's a uh, military base where the sewage leaks onto adjoining properties. Those are physical um, takings and in, in migrations. But then a number of years ago, some new law developed that said, if you have a government regulation that takes so much of the value of the land that it's almost worthless, that's a taking. And taking cases are very difficult for property owners to win. Very few of them. It's got to take almost all of the value of the property. So there are many cases out there where a property might be worth, you know, a million dollars without any zoning. And a particular zoning regulation or two cuts the value down to a hundred thousand. That's probably not a taking. It's got to take almost all the value of the property. Now I'm overgeneralizing a lot, but um, very rarely is a government regulation a taking unless it effectively precludes you from almost precludes you totally from 
using the land the way it was intended or taking almost all of the value of the land. Again, there are a lot of cases out there that, that with one type of zoning, a developer could get on a parcel 100 houses and with the zoning in effect, they can only get five and the courts have upheld the five. So it's, it's pretty rare that a taking lawsuit is uh, successful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, I, I see we have another hand. Diane, did you have another question or was that left over from before? Oh, it looks like you do. Okay, great. I, yeah, I have another question. Um, with deed restrictions, um, we have deed restrictions in our association for like trailers and storage of basically <clears throat> um, construction debris, et cetera, on empty lots and not allowing that. Is the only way to enforce it to go actually after the person who is violating it, meaning one property owner or neighbor to another, or can our association enforce those types of deed restrictions, thereby not allowing you know bad blood amongst neighbors, basically? Yeah, and it usually you, you have to look at the deed restrictions and it's gotta say. I mean, usually it'll say any lot owner can enforce it, which means generally the association can't. Some of them say the association can, which means no lot owner can. Some will say the lot owner and the association. If the association can, the, the way I found the most successful is for the association to have a deed restriction enforcement committee. And people are willing to be the bad guys and gals and serve on that committee. Because like you say, it's easier for the association, particularly a committee to write the letter and so on than an individual property owner. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Great, and we still have some questions that were in the chat as well. Um, what are the laws on goose removal? <laughs> I'm not an expert in that area. What little I know is it, I think it's gotta be a, a DNR approved process for goose removal because there are animal cruelty laws and so on. So I, I guess I'm gonna have to defer maybe Melissa to you or, <laughs> Yeah, our folks, you know, I, I know there's certain things that are approved and certain that are and the DNR will allow you to do certain things on certain lakes, but not other lakes. Yeah, there was also a question from the same person about beach sanding. And I think that again is something that we can address um, kind of separately from like a legal standpoint, because they were just talking about, they want someone to stop beach sanding and what can, what they can do. So I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, the only issue is that I can't decipher from what you've called yourself here, um, what your name is. So if you could email me, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you about the goose issue and the beach sanding. All right. And it looks like we have a question from Rex. Melissa, the, uh, the DNR has a very specific bit of information on uh, goose control on their website. So that caller could actually get what she needs off of that or he or she could get what she needs off of that. Um, and we've looked at it because our lake has uh, uh, got a high concentration of geese and they've been proven to be the major cause of swimmer's itch on our lake. So we're very interested in, uh, in goose removal, but it seems to be a fairly arduous project uh, but the DNR does have a program, so that's where you got to start. The other issue on uh, beach sanding, um, it, it's a fine line on where beach sanding is considered routine or where it needs to be permit, and it's all tied to the ordinary high water mark. Um, if it's below the high water mark, DNR and Eagle are very specific and says it does require a permit. And if somebody's doing that and not getting the permit, then you got to go into my waters and file a, a, a a, a, a formal complaint uh, to initiate any action. Uh, DNR during the COVID period was uh, a little slow on some of their uh, complaint follow-up efforts, uh, but we have used it uh, in, in our area to uh, get some folks to get some permits in place for permanent docks that they were trying to sneak in without any approvals. Uh, but that's the process for uh, 
the beach sanding thing is to uh, file the complaint through my waters, which in itself can be a complicated process, but their reporting feature for uh, the public is fairly straightforward. You can go to the My Waters website and it'll walk you through how to do that. Great, Rex, thanks. All right, and then there was one more um, comment, I guess, basically, it, it's really, it's actually, it, it, is, it is a question, but I just thought that you would appreciate it, Cliff. Um, this person says, and actually this is our riparian of the year who said this, Am I alone in feeling that as a riparian, my rights are limited, and yet I am negatively affected by numerous impacts of others' actions, transfer of AIS, responsibility for injury of trespassers, presumably wake boats, eroding shorelines and bottomland effects, et cetera? Yeah, obviously I've had a little bit of time to think about this, and I, I, I think the same thing, the same factor that makes lake living attractive causes those problems that were just mentioned and because it, 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 it's a joint use property, it's a community property. If you are not on a lake or river stream and you have five acres out in the country and so on, you're pretty insulated overall, unless you have a private road, then the community is a private road, but the lake is a common resource. Even on a private lake, everyone on the lake uses that resource. And so whenever you have a joint use property there's things that are really great, but there's sources of conflict. Um, you know, that's one of the big issues that a lot of attorneys are dealing with in saving the family cottage is mom and dad, grandma and grandpa own it. They're the dictators, benevolent dictators usually. What happens when it goes to the four kids? Try to, you know, it's, it's a rare family where the four kids can get along all the time. Now, now on a lake, it's not four kids, it's 100 or 200. So I think it's the community joint usage of the lake that causes a lot of the problems. Okay, well, we have Lisa with her hand up. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, Cliff, Lisa again. One, one more Lisa. quick question. I know where Sylvan Lake is in Nuevo County. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, we love it. It's very special, that's for sure. So um, the que my question is, is we have a lot we're on a point so it's like a corner if you're in a subdivision um that our lot that runs along our lot so and we are paying taxes on it we're taxed at 125 percent of the normal rate based on the excessive land to the east of us so would that in it is an easement so would that give us some type of ownership? Yeah, the, the way most assessors deal with this, not all, is if you have a parallel road between you and the lake, you're repairing, but it's reduced, your assessment's reduced somewhat. So if I have 100 feet of frontage on a lake and there's no easement along the front, you know, I'm assessed at 50% of 100% of the value. If I have a road right away, they might say, well, you know, without the road right away there, your property would be worth $300,000. And I, I find that it takes away $50,000 of the value. Because although you own underneath, you know, there's no road there now, but people can walk up and down. So I think that's what most assessors do is if they find you to be lakefront, but it's it, some of the lakefronts burdened by a park or a road right of way or an alley they'll reduce the fair market value by some factor. Well, but in our case, they're charging us more, 125%. Yeah, see again, Lisa, without a map, it's almost impossible for me to get down into specifics, but yeah. you know, you can always appeal the, appeal the tax assessment. Okay. Or how they're doing it or the ratio or the, the formula. The local board of review has the authority to vary that. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think I got all the questions. Was there anyone else who felt I missed you? I, I didn't intend to do that, certainly. Um, or have any other questions that you would like to bring up? We're almost at six o'clock, so I feel like it's, you know, we're rounding out the hour here.
Okay. Well, Cliff, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a really great uh, presentation, very informative, and I know that everyone found it helpful. Well, and Melissa, um, I, I very much appreciate all the people who attended, the people that read the Repairing Magazine, my articles. You know, it's a, it's a great family, and I look forward to seeing everyone next year at Thompsonville at Crystal Mountain. Yep, we have the date saved for May 6th or 7th, um, which would be, you know, just one weekend into the future from this one um, next year. So May 6th and 7th, 2022, we're hoping to see everyone there. Um, I really appreciate everybody today joining us, all the speakers. This has been a really great day. And, um, you know, stay tuned. We have lots more things coming up. We have a region meeting coming up next weekend. Um, the Lake and Stream Leadership Institute is going to have a workshop in June. You can find information about that on our website. We're going to have the, uh, that wake boat study presentation in June as well. And I already know that there are a few sessions that we're going to have follow-ups on uh, coming up here soon too. So again, thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great day. Don't forget to check out our sponsors if you're looking for um, some help with your, your lake or your water body, um, check out our sponsors. Um, you can find them in your agenda and also on our website. Uh, you know, find yourself a, an MLSA hat or shirt that you might like. All of our speakers today are going to be receiving an MLSA hat um, when those are finished. So they can wear those with pride. And, uh, you know, if you don't already subscribe to the magazine, um, you can do that on our website as well. So... Thanks again, everyone. Have a Thank wonderful you. weekend. Thank you.